Welcome. Uh, we're here at the uh, Latin America conference, uh, but we're, we, in this case, are the uh, are representing the Estonian Council on Foreign Relations, and we are taking the opportunity to talk to some of the distinguished guests who are here this weekend. Uh, today, I have with me uh, former Foreign Minister, former Prime Minister Karl Bildt, uh, who has been uh, ever since Estonian independence been an instrumental figure in our development. Welcome, Carl. Pleasure and honor. Mm -hmm. Well, Carl goes back a long way with us and with Estonia. I am in uh, the, uh, from 91, 1991 to 1994, there were really only two political figures who were uh, pushing the removal of Russian troops from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and those were Bill Clinton in the United States and Carl Bildt in Europe. Sad to say, there weren't too many other people doing that, but nonetheless, you were instrumental in that. And so, while I'd like to talk more about where we are today in security policy. Where do you think we would be if we had not gotten rid of the Russian troops? We know what's happening in Moldova. You know, in Georgia, they're still there. I imagine Estonia or Latvia with Russian troops. We tend to forget that particular period. We think it was easy. It wasn't that easy, because there were a couple of uh, a couple of events during that period that were dangerous. Uh, there could have been a Transnistria in uh, in Estonia. There were clearly plots underway by by some to set that up. Uh, in the northeastern parts of the country, where would we be? The, I think the entire northern European security situation would have been different if that has been the case. Needless to say, the situation of Estonia as well. There were a couple of cases in uh, Latvia when they were threatening to use forces and let the forces stay as well, if things didn't happen. So it was a pretty dramatic period, but it ended rather well. And what ends well tends to be forgotten. Well, it is, I mean, if the Russian troops had remained as they continue in other parts of Europe, we would never have joined the European Union and never have gotten into NATO. Nope, it would have been very difficult. And it would have been sort of a divisive issue, which it would have been constant conflicts of different sorts. Um, and we were able to also, with wisdom on the Estonian and the Latvian side, to make sort of a temporary arrangements for the dismantling of the Paldiski nuclear facility, dismantling of the big Skunda radar station in uh, Latvia. They kept that for some additional years. But at the end of the day, it has to be said that the Russians stuck to the agreements that we made and uh, left in time. Well, that was back then when they still did. Well, of course, now the security situation in Northern Europe has changed completely. Uh, the first big change was the accession of the Baltic countries to NATO and the European Union in 2004. But now we have first the accession of um, Finland to NATO uh, this year. And now and we're all eagerly awaiting the accession of Sweden. How, how do you see that coming? Well, I see that coming. I can't make any prediction exactly on which day, but I've got certainly it's happening due to sort of turmoil on in certain NATO member countries, but it will happen. And that will, of course, over time uh, be a fairly fundamental transformation of the defense arrangements in Northern Europe. Because if I look at it from the Swedish perspective, we've had a national defense defending the territory of Sweden and forces geared and planned for that particular purpose. We will have, now have to have forces that are part of a Northern North, Northern European integrated defense, where we will be sort of the the rear of the defense of the Baltic states. We will be part of the Arctic uh, northern flank or northern area uh, defense arrangements. We will have to integrate air defenses in a way that we have not been able to think of previously. There will inevitably be a new maritime arrangement for the Baltic Sea. Uh, there will be new command and control arrangement for NATO over time. Nothing of this is going to happen in the next few weeks or even the next few months. It's going to take a couple of years. Well, clearly, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it, it will it will happen. It will take some time, and it will be then a far more robust and secure arrangement for all of our countries. Absolutely. Well, uh, we know that um, 
In 2013, on Good Friday, when the uh, Russian backfire bombers flew through the Gulf of Finland and were heading towards Stockholm, that it was actually thanks to the uh, air monitoring and policing in Lithuania at the time that actually woke up Sweden that something bad was happening. Not quite. We knew it as well. No one, no one rose up in the air. No, no, and we didn't do that uh, for very specific reasons because we don't do that all the time. We only do it when we think there are specific reasons to do it, and and we were through other means available, fairly well aware of exactly when they were coming and who they were. But nonetheless, now we see that the Baltic Sea will become, for all intents and purposes, except for a. A little pimple there between Lithuania and, and 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 Poland, and another something back there in the in the in the end of the Gulf of Finland will be a will be a NATO lake. I mean, for all intents and purposes. I mean, when just military defense uh, becomes an altogether different matter. Um, we have been concerned about the Suwalki corridor because if you cut from Belarus through to Kaliningrad or vice versa, you would cut off the Baltic countries from uh, from the rest of NATO. But with a Baltic NATO lake, everything can go everywhere. It becomes easier. It's still a question of getting across the Baltic Sea, but it's uh, uh, it's a different proposition entirely when we can integrate the entire region in terms of logistics and air defense and uh, troops and forces deployments so it makes all of us uh, more secure uh, Kaliningrad is going to be a special problem and I think the Russians are going to be very nervous about Kaliningrad because that's an exposed position from their point of view and from that point of view I could be rather good in the sense that it sort of keeps them keeps them careful in the Baltic Sea, since they have this very sort of, uh, or in the Baltic area, since they have this very exposed position in Kaliningrad, which remains important to them. Well, how do, how do you see the uh, Swedish Swedish defense integrating into NATO at this point? What are the what are the tasks? Well, I think the number one thing that will happen uh, fairly fast is to begin the integration of the uh, air defense structures. Um, that's, uh, we already are linked up in terms of surveillance systems, but we are not 100% linked up. We linked up for the command and control arrangements as well. And then we can also be somewhat more uh, rational when it comes to uh, quick reaction alerts and things like that. I mean, for example, if you want to go up and inspect something in a Russian flight over the Baltic Sea, um, it can be done either from one of the Baltic states, or it can be done from Sweden. We don't need to spend yeah, fuel, fuel yeah. will right. unnecessarily for well <laughs> take care of the global climate and flying somewhat less because we can do it in a somewhat more rational manner. Well, it helps we move on to uh, more efficient procurements too, since we don't have to... Yeah, hope. well, one could hope that. Um, that's going to take some time. We haven't seen them. We haven't seen it between the Baltic countries either. Uh, we haven't seen it inside NATO. Uh, either, I mean, but I think we could now. With uh, hopefully, I would hope so. But I mean, the fact that even going back to Cold War days, you couldn't get the French and the Germans to agree on the same tank, in spite of the fact that they were going to fight exactly the same enemy at more or less exactly the same spot. Well, I'm I'm hoping that uh, with the the example, the positive example of long-term cooperation between, say, Finland, and Sweden, can sort of be transferred to to our region and we would see greater integration because it's quite clear that, I mean, that when it comes to defense, uh, geography is of paramount importance, except in cyber defense, but that's a different matter. And I was actually going to touch upon cyber defense that actually, if you look at the, the leading countries in cyber defense today are actually all up here in the North. Uh, but it ha uh, it's been mainly a national matter but I think that um, that one area where geography and geopolitics is less important, which is in cyberspace, um, because we all know each other or when we're up here in one place, I, I certainly am hoping for in the next 10, 15 years, much closer cooperation between Swedish, 
Finnish and Estonian, if not uh, other, or also Baltic countries, in developing a more robust uh, cyber defense in NATO, where, frankly, it's been very slow going. I think it's been slow going, both in NATO and within the EU. EU has, of course, more in terms of security standards and things like that. But some of these things we do in terms of cyber defense and cyber capabilities are so sensitive that we don't want to share them within EU 27 or NATO, how many member states it is, but it's more sort of the bilateral cooperation with the countries that you really trust. And of course, Sweden, Estonia, Finland, Norway is fairly good at these things as well. Uh, the UK is closely aligned to us. I mean, that's sort of a natural circle of uh, trusted cooperation on these issues. Well, for me at least, I think that is an area where we have the at least the political political will to move on because it's. I mean, cyber defense is really tough to do. It's precisely. really tough, but it's based on trust. You really must trust the partner that you are sharing your uh, ultimate secrets with as well, because it well, relates we, also. I think we we are there. Uh, I mean, closer th to that oh, yeah. in this region than I would. Look at other regions. Oh yeah, no um, doubt. I mean, even within NATO. Uh, no doubt, but I mean that what you say now is important because it applies to virtually everything. The Nordic or Northern European countries, and you used to say that Estonia is also a Nordic country. So I let's still do. yes, quite. <laughs> we expanded the Nordic area. We are closer to each other, and have better possibilities for cooperation in virtually every area than in virtually any other region that you can find. So I think the fact that uh, I would wish that the Norwegians were in the EU as well, but, but that's not going to happen immediately. But apart from that, um, the fact that we are now within the EU and NATO, um, that's going to facilitate, I think, a lot of cooperation also in other areas of society and economy, and that's going to be... Well, certainly I hope it also within NATO. Since we, uh, the, uh, one, of our, one of the shocks I had while in office was when we discovered a... Russian worm in our military networks, and so we went to NATO saying, oh, look what we found. And the answer was, oh, you too, which was not the right answer. No. So, well, I'm uh, glad you're back in Estonia once again. Always happy to be here. <laughs> we, uh, I hope that um, our government and your government uh, will be uh, eager to pursue more cooperation and the we, king was here just absolutely a week ago. as you were over in this when you were president of a state visit in stockholm now that we had the king and the queen here on a state visit of symbolic importance but important as such well but i mean it, it's important that with especially the the security here taking a leap forward that we all sort of uh, understand the challenges and uh, and what is the more even more than challenges, what we can possibly achieve here, and that have n things that have not been achieved. So, thank you, Carl, for everything you have done for Estonia over the years. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Now, that thank you.